Guten Morgen. That's about all the German I remember from my German classes. A few more words, but not much. Greetings in Jesus' name. It's good to be with you. Uh, we come from Pennsylvania. Greetings from PA. And isn't it great that the Lord is great, that he can be not only in every state with us in every state of the United States, but in every country. And it's a blessing to be together this morning. I invite you to turn with me to Genesis and chapter 4. Okay, there we go. Title this message, Who's in Control? This would be 1 Moses 4. And the looking at, and I'd like to look at a number of chapters here in Genesis this morning and see a common thread that goes through this and learn from these verses, from this scripture, some things. As I look at the scripture, especially the Old Testament, I see and better understand God and people and how we can walk with God. And so I've titled it, Who's in Control? Let's begin reading here in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam knew Eva's wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she get again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So we see that children were born here to Adam and Eve, and we read on, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So they both brought offerings. Cain brought an offering, Abel brought an offering, both of them. It seems that Cain brought what was convenient here for him, and Abel brought what God wanted, evidently, as we can understand this. He brought his offering, and God showed his desirable offering. Let's read on here in verse 5. But unto Cain, we, in the second part of 4 there, we had that God had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect, verse 5 says. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So God showed his desirable offering. And we see that the response then of Cain. God says, Abel has brought what was acceptable to God, and Cain not so. And in response to God's response to their offering... Cain, is, it says his countenance fell, and then the Lord responds to him. I had to think of the response of Ahab also later in Scripture. King Ahab wanted to have a vineyard that was another man's, and it was a family, and so it was not to, by God's law, it was not to be sold outside of the family, and yet Ahab says, I want it, and He's not satisfied with the way God had directed. He wanted to change things. And the challenge for me as we look at these scriptures, the challenge I want to bring to you is to recognize the challenge that we have also as people and that especially some of these people in the early uh, part of scripture here had with looking at, am I going to accept God as the one in control or am I trying to be in control of how the world works, how God's law is, and so who is in control of my life, who's in control of my decisions. Let's read on here. The Lord says then unto Cain, why are you wroth? Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? He says in verse 7, if you do well, shall not you be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at your door, and unto you shall be his desire, 
and thou shalt rule over him. So he says to him that Cain wanted to change the rules. He wanted to control the rules. Sometimes we get to that, don't we? Well, it doesn't make sense, and we want to control. And I look at this and recognize the end. Where does this lead to? We want to see that as we go along here. Where does this attitude of wanting to control, not willing to submit to God, lead us to? Cain not only wanted to control the rules, let's read on in verse 8, Cain also wanted to control others. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And so he doesn't like it that God accepted Abel, but didn't accept his offering. And so what does he do? Get It's interesting as we go through the world to recognize that people, what they'll go to when somebody is walking right, and they're not, but they want to get rid of that so that they look better. And this is what Cain did. He kills his brother Abel. We know this story well, I trust. But he wanted to control others so that put Abel out of the way. Now, I'm the one that should be acceptable. But control leads to death and fear and no joy. Let's read on here in chapter 4, verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, What have you done? The voice of thy, your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now are you cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood from thy hand. When you till the ground, it will not yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive, a vagabond, shalt thou be in the earth. You might feel like your ground is not bearing fruit right now here with the dryness. But it was not just everywhere, but where the curse was upon Cain. And he said, where you go, you won't be able to have that continued garden. You won't be able to have a city. You're going to need to be traveling, moving around, a vagabond, one who can't settle down. And then in verse 13, he responds to this. Cain says unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. He said, this is too much. If I'm always going to have to be foraging for food, always having to be moving from place to place, that is too much. He said, Behold, you have driven me out this day from the face of the earth, from thy face. Shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive, a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that finds me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any man should find him, should kill him. And so God says, no, I'll, I'll mark, it's not like everybody's going to be against you. No one's going to kill you. I'll still protect you. But he was, God was giving him a chance to again repent, to change his ways, to allow himself and his will to be submitted to God. But he doesn't do this. He says it's just too much, and he keeps complaining and saying, this is awful, this is just too much. Control takes away from God. Let's read on here, verse 16. And I find this very interesting, Cain's response. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and he dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and she built a, he built a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son. So the, here Cain, he is supposed to be a fugitive, vagabond, not be able to settle down in one place. And so he builds this city, but he gives the name to his, of his son instead of his own name. He builds it in the name of his son. And so he's working against God here. He's seeking to not accept the consequences that God has given him for his disobedience and for his not willing to follow God. If you read down, it starts talking about Enoch, and you continue to read down through these next number of verses, and we see that Cain's lineage comes to naught. This Enoch that he had for a son is not the Enoch that we know about that lived 365 years and was not because God took him because he was walking with God, but this is a different Enoch. I have come to realize that there are some names here that are repeated also, George and Agatha and John. 
uh, yeah, there are probably more, but you have some names that are repeated, and so it was in these times. And so this Enoch is not the same one that we look at later. But let's go down to verse 26 now and pick up reading. 426. Seth comes, is born to Adam and Eve, and to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then man began to call upon the name of the Lord. So we're going to have some contrasts here in these first verses. We have Cain, his lineage comes to naught. Seth's lineage goes on. As a matter of fact, if we read down through here in the generations in chapter 5 of this first book of Moses, we have a number of names given to us, and we're given this whole lineage of Seth. Seth it gives birth to uh, Enos and, and on down, and then we get the Enoch that we're familiar with, and Methuselah, and Lamech, and finally Noah that we're more familiar with. And the question that comes to me is a question that says, what kind of family lineage are you building? And here we see the lineage depended, how it went in the long run, depended on the obedience or disobedience of me, of Cain or of Seth. Cain in disobedience, not willing to submit to God, and his lineage comes to naught. What is life going to be like when you're gone? Are people going to miss you or are they going to say, wow, wonderful? Uh, where is it going to be? It's With this verse 26 here in chapter 4, it says that Seth, when he had his son, he was leading in a way that people, his lineage began to call upon the name of God. And so we see the difference, the contrast. Cain going away from God, Seth going toward God. What will your lineage be? Whether it's biological or also those that you influence. There are more people that you influence than just your children. And especially thinking about young people, what about the peers you influence and other people around you? How, what's, go, what's it going to come to? What's your influence going to be like? I found a couple of phrases that are very interesting, and one of those is, it's not so important the family you come from as the family that comes from you. Who is going to be the ones who are following you? The ones who are leading. Which way are you leading? What's going to be the result of that? What is going to happen? Another phrase that someone has said, live your life in a way that you will be missed when you are gone. Missed in a good way, recognizing and also that they can look to your life. And not just when I'm gone, but also now. Can people follow me? When people follow my way, does it cause them to call upon the name of the Lord or do they go away from the Lord? That's the contrast we have. Let's move over to chapter 6. Most of the chapter 5 here is a lot of the lineage here of Seth. But let's look into chapter 6 and 7 and look at some wickedness. And the wickedness becomes more rampant as we look. We know chapter 6 and 7 to be that of the flood of Noah being born here. It was mentioned in chapter 5 there about the lineage that he comes from Seth's line. Seth was his ancestor. And the wickedness becomes more and more rampant. However, well, let's read the first six, seven verses here of chapter 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were, that they were fair, and they took them, the wives, all of them which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. There were also giants on the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, that same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination, every imagination, every thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. And the Lord says, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and the fowl of the air. It repenteth me that I have made them. Things became so wicked. It's kind of interesting to see here that men were 
getting bigger, more self-dependent, more self-reliant, possibly, and that they could take care of things themselves, and so they weren't dependent on God. If we begin to think that I am something great, that we can do it without God, it's going to come to naught, and the way there is not good. And so we need to recognize God always as we go through life. Verse 8 says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was one who had this godly lineage from Seth down through Enoch, through Methuselah, Lamech. And so he had this wonderful lineage here. He had been blessed and he seems to walk in a way that God can bless and God can walk with him. Noah is given this edict then. And he's told by God what to do to build the ark. And in verse 22, we see God's response to that. Well, let's look first of all at some of the characteristics. He was different from those around him. In Matthew chapter 7, it says that we need to enter into the straight or the narrow gate because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. But it says that there are going to be few that enter in. But straight is the gate and wide is the broad is the way that leads to destruction and many people are going this way. It's always the small amount that is, are the ones who are going right. I wonder in our society today, how do we judge right and wrong? It seems the society around us in this country, I don't know for sure about Texas, but at least in ours, what I hear is people saying, well, if everybody thinks that this is right, then that's what's right, almost judging right and wrong by the majority. Well, the majority is usually wrong. It's usually going the broad way, the wrong way, and it's going to lead to death. And so we need to recognize that we will not always be in the majority. We will not always, it's a blessing to have a brotherhood of people around us that are also walking with God. But as we go out in the world, we recognize there are a lot of others who are not following God, and it grieves us, or should grieve us as it grieves God. So he was different from those around him. He was recognizing that God was one to be followed, and he hears from God. In verse 12, God says, he looked upon the earth and it was corrupt, and God says to Noah in verse 13, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with all the earth. And so he tells God, he tells Noah, God tells Noah his plan. He said, I'm going to destroy everything, and I'm going to destroy the world, I'm going to destroy all the other people. And so he gives him this work to do. His God's expectation was upon all, but only Noah followed God and heard God's call. And Noah receives a promise in verse 18. He says, But with you I will establish my covenant. You shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you, and every living thing. And so he gives him this big work to do. Noah receives this promise that he's going to be protected. And then we read in verse 22, Noah obeyed. Noah did according to all that God commanded him. So did he. He did everything that God commanded him over in chapter 7 and verse 5. If you turn over there, it says that Noah did according to all that God commanded him. Everything. Noah obeyed and built the ark. A big work. It took him 100 years. In this country, we look around. I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to go over to Europe and it was interesting to see some of the buildings that had been built 500 years ago or more, and some of them taking 100 years to build. Can you imagine having to build? Some of you are builders. Can you imagine having to work at a building for 100 years? It would be more than your lifetime, probably, that you started and someone else has to finish. And so the, the building is still there, and to get back to the United States and think, which buildings do we have here that are 300 years old or more? There aren't any because nothing was being built here back then. But here, a hundred years working at getting this ready. And Noah goes in. He builds this. And in verse 7, it says, Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with them unto the ark. 
because of the water of the flood, but yet no water had ever fallen. Not a drop of water had ever come down yet. It was watered by a mist that went up. They didn't rely on rain at this point in time yet in the history of the world. And so Noah goes in, and going down to verse 21 here in chapter 7, it says, All flesh, the flood came for 40 days of rain and day and night, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both fowl and of cattle, of beasts, of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth and every man. So Noah goes in and was saved. And then over in chapter 8, verse 18, the floodwaters have gone off, and Noah goes out. He went forth, and his sons and his wives and his son's wife. Again, according to the command of God, he obeys God, and he goes out. And what does he do as soon as he gets out? Verse 20, Noah builds an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and of every clean and, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. He worships God. He comes out. He's the only one, the new earth. It's only he and his family that are alive. And so all is going to come there. And as he's there, he receives a promise. In chapter 9, verse 16, God gives us the rainbow. The bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, and I'll remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh. And God says, I'll never destroy the world by a flood, the whole world by a flood again. We have floods here and there, but not the whole world like it was then being destroyed. And so Noah worships God and he receives this promise. And by his obedience, by his example, his godly example of obedience, the scriptures call him a preacher. He preached in his day and he also preaches to us today. In Peter, it talks about he being dead yet preaches. We still have that example and that recognition of his obedience to God. And I would just like to contrast these two men that we talked about a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, thinking of Cain and of Noah. And I'd like to look at the contrast between the two. Cain rejected God's direction. He went against it. Noah accepted God's direction, though it was difficult to understand, difficult to do. It was a hard work, yet he did it. He didn't say, well, I have to be in control. God, no, we're going to build the boat a little different because you have the proportions off. No, it says he obeyed. He doesn't say, well, you know, these animals, that's too much to store up all that food. I don't know if you've been to the rebuilding of the ark there in Kentucky, but the, to see and think about the size of it, and how big it is, and how much work to gather all the food for there, and to have all the animals come in, and to work with that and be with them for all those days. You'd have to enjoy animals and not be afraid of the dogs coming chasing you, as some might be. What does seeking control say? What does it say about me? What does it say about life? If we are not seeking control, then we're not trusting God. If we're seeking, rather, to control, it says to me that we're wanting, we're not trusting God because I'm not sure. Maybe it won't rain, Moses could have said. But no, he trusted God. Cain says, well, I'm not sure that I can trust God, that he'll, you know, why didn't he change his way? Why didn't he God said, you can change your way, and I'll, you'll be accepted. But Cain says, no, nah, I'm not sure that I trust you, God. Trying to be in control, I think, says that we're trusting ourselves, My own thinking, my own way, my own reasoning better than God. Accepting God's direction says that we trust him, even if it doesn't seem to make sense. Sometimes we look at things, and it doesn't make sense at all. Why? You think of especially the disciples. It doesn't make sense that Jesus would allow himself to be crucified. If he's going to be king, that doesn't work in our rational mind. And a lot of times, it doesn't. the kingdom of God doesn't make sense to the rational mind. And so are we going to obey God in those times when it doesn't make sense? Or are we going to obey what we think and go our own way and trust ourselves? We can either choose the path 
and accept the destiny, or we can choose the destiny and accept the path. Are we going to accept that we want to follow God, we want to live with God, and accept the path? For Noah, that meant he was going to receive salvation, he was going to be saved from the flood, but it meant hard work on that path. Cain, he says, oh, I want it this way, and he didn't care so much where it ended up. How do we live our lives? Who's in control of my life? Who's in control of your life? Do we obey? Do we submit to God? I remember a story of a man who, a man was in the hospital. He recognized his illness was terminal. And his son came to visit him, and he said to him, he said to his son, you know, I'm not going to need my car anymore. And there's a family in the congregation. I heard their car broke down. It's not worth fixing. Why don't you take and give my car to, those, to that family? And the son said, left, and he said, well, you know, that's a good idea. Dad's not going to need his car anymore. And so he goes and he signs that car. He was POA. He signed that car over to the family that needed the car, the car broken down, wasn't fixable, they couldn't afford another one. And so this, uh, he comes back to his dad another day and visits with his dad. His dad said, did you sell the car to those people? Did you give it to them? And he said, yes, I gave it to them. He said, that's great. And he said, I, I've been also thinking that this sum of money, a certain sum of money, he said, I heard that uh, there, was a fa- there was a need there. He said, I'd like to have you go. And it was a sizable sum of money. And his son left and thought, well, yeah, that's good. Dad's not going to need this money, and that he wants to give it. And so he, he gave, he went and, and did that. And he comes back to visit his dad, and dad says, did you give that money to that family? He said, yes, I did. He said, wonderful, that's, that's really great. He said, I'd uh, have another thing. He says, my, the house, I'm not going to need my house anymore. And I heard the family and the congregation lost their house, it burned down, and and so I'd like you to give the house to that family and sign that over to them. And the son left and he thought about it. He said, you know, this house I grew up in and it's got a lot of memories. And even if dad doesn't need it, I need to keep some of the things. And I think I should keep the house. And so he, he decided not to do it. The question is, how many times did this son submit to the father's request? You might say once, you might say, well, all three times he did what the father asked, or two times he did what the father asked. But you know, he, if, if it's our decision, if we have to reason that it makes sense to obey, it's not submission. It's not submitting. He, he didn't really obey any times. He reasoned and he decided to do it kind of on his own. Do I have, does it have to make sense to me for me to obey God? Submission is obeying even when it doesn't make sense. Or it's hard work. And Noah saw that. One day I was working. I work as a painter. And in this family that I often work for, I, usually the, the wife comes up with ideas of what has to be done and renovations. And we go in and do the work. And, of course, we mess, make a mess as we work. And one time we... The husband said, you know, every time we gather together for a family gathering, it's, it's tight in this dining room. And there was a hallway next to the dining room. He said, let's break the wall open and widen this. And the challenge to it was that it was an 18-inch stone wall between the hall and the dining room that went up through the second floor. And so to conquer that and, and not tear the whole house apart, they put a beam up in the attic and had u-bolts going up over and steel plates holding the ceiling up and then they could take that wall out of the first floor and leave the 18 inch stone wall on the second floor it made a mess i don't know if any of you have tried anything like that but it's it's very messy and one day she was sitting there and looking rather distraught at this whole mess as i was there painting we were getting toward the end of it and i said how are you doing she said it's so hard to submit when you don't agree And I said, if you have to agree, is it submission? And she said, Larry, don't meddle. And, but, you know, it feels like it's meddling sometimes because I don't want to do it. I don't want to. And that's when we can learn to submit to God. 
Cain was told he was going to be a vagabond and going on. I'd like to go over to chapter 11 and think about it. We saw that Cain built a city. He named it after his son. And now we get in chapter 11 to some other people that wanted to build a city. The Tower of Babel, we call it. The Lord came down to see this city. Verse 5 of chapter 11. The Lord comes down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. Now, the whole earth was of one language at this time, and it came to pass that they were concerned about this. We better go back up to verse 3 and see what the people said. They said one to another, go let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone, slime they had for mortar, and they said, let us build a city and a tower whose top reaches unto heaven. They wanted to get to God in their own way, get to heaven, and let us make us a name. They want to make their own name. Lest we be scattered abroad. They want to make sure they had security that they didn't get scattered around. They want to be close. They want to be always able to look back to that tower and say, oh, that's the direction to go. And they said, we don't want to be scattered upon the whole face of the earth. And God comes down and looks at it. They were trying to do their own thing, build their own city. And God comes down and he brings confusion to them. I can't imagine that next day how it was. They were trying to control things. They were trying to do, get to heaven. They wanted to make sure they stayed together, take control of things. And that next day, they come and a man says, you know, hand me a block. And he says, what's this do? And, you know, the next man comes on and he says, como estas? Now, excuse my English and Spanish. I don't know anymore. And it probably wasn't right in your dialect either, but he, uh, I found out the Pennsylvania Dutch is not near like your Platt Dutch, and I don't know much of the Pennsylvania Dutch, so I'm one of those people who only know one language, they're called American, and you know, before that, it was okay, before the Tower of Babel, this whole confusion of language here is because of this time. And so we have these people who are building cities for security, trying to take their own security into their own hands. As I like to think of some of these characteristics of Cain, of these people here in chapter 11, thinking about control, wanting control, what is that like? First of all, we look at them. They didn't want to accept God's direction. They didn't want to accept God's discipline. Cain didn't want to. He built his own city. He found his own way. He wanted to get what he wanted. He wasn't able to build, have a garden. He was always going to have to go from place to place. The ground wasn't going to yield. And so he tries to do this on his own. The question is, how do I try to take care of my own security? How do you try to take care of your own security? Now, I understand there are things that we need to do. But again, are we trusting God in the final of it? Or are we really trusting in ourselves? Thinking about this city building, let's look. What is city building? Any man who takes the energy of the flesh to find all available resources to make life work. Trusting in self, not in God. The evil desires or the motto of a city builder is that I'm going to do whatever I have to do to avoid a dry time, to avoid a time, a desert experience, to get away from it. I'm going to do whatever I have to do, use all the resources in life. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't irrigate. I'm not saying that we don't have to do things. But in the end, at the end of the day, do I, am I really relying upon myself and my own thinking, my own decisions, or am I trusting God how to go? Trying to avoid those desert experiences. We recognize we have difficult times. The hatred of city builders, what is that? It's a fear of failure. A fear of of recognizing and coming to a place where I recognize I can't do it of myself. I need God. To recognize that God is needed, that I have personal inadequacies. And so the question they're always asking is, do I have what it takes Do do I have? Notice their focus on me. Focus on what do I have instead of what is God directing me? Why is this happening? What's going on here? What does God want to teach me? What should I be learning? 
The passion is I will always explain things and I'm always going to control things. This idea of control. And again, the title that I've titled this message is who is really in control of your life? Is God in control or am I? Is God in control of your life or are you? The mode of operation of the city builders is to reduce mystery and replace it with orderliness, management, and control. We like those things, don't we? And they're good to have. It's good to have management. It's good to have things in order. But at the same time, is that more important than following God? And sometimes you go into things and it's a mystery. Kind of like marriage, right? You go in and you're not quite sure that you understand your wife or your husband. He doesn't make sense sometimes. Last night, some people were talking about men having a nothing box and a time where they just aren't thinking of anything, really. And, and women don't understand that. And there's a lot about women that we don't understand, though we grow in understanding as we walk and live together. And it's a blessing. Mystery, marriage is wonderful, but there is a mystery to it. If you go in thinking you got it all figured out, you're in for a surprise. Do you ever say amen? Okay, we'll go on here. I think you agree with me, okay. Two of you men are agreeing at least. I think they were the pastors. No, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but there's mystery. How about in our relationship with God? Are we okay with walking with God even though we're not quite sure about it? And maybe you ladies can better understand what it's like to walk in submission and this mystery of following without it making sense sometimes because maybe we don't make sense but yet you have learned to follow and hopefully we know where we're going however we recognize at the same time we men aren't as infallible as God but to to walk in a way and God says this relationship of man and woman is a picture to help us understand our relationship our walk with Christ and so, how do we walk? The Hopefully not as a city builder. What is the hope for city builders? We see the problem of trying to control, of trying to make our own way, figure everything out, have everything taken care of and we're under our control. Well, what's the hope? The hope is exactly facing what we would fear, the desert experience. I have to think of the children of Israel they're out in the wilderness, and they get to Ai there, and they're supposed to go in and conquer. The spies come back, and they give this report. And it's interesting to me, all 12 of their names are given in Scripture, but how many do you remember? You remember two. The two who said, focused on God, Joshua and Caleb, they said, we can, we can do it with God's help. And the, uh, the 10 said, no, they're, they're big. I mean, we... They, they're just giants there, and they have walled cities, and we can't do it. And we don't remember their names. They, ended, they said, we don't want to go in. And then when God brought the consequence that they were going to have to go 40, day, 40 years in the wilderness, in the desert, they said, oh, we don't want to do that. We're going to go, and, and now we're going to go do what we were supposed to before. But now Moses said, no, that's not the choice. Now, God doesn't give multiple choice here. He was telling you, giving you a directive of what to do. You didn't do it, so now you're going to walk 40 years. And they said, oh, our, our, we're going to die in the desert. We're going to face this desert. And Moses said, yeah, that's the consequence. And so the very thing they feared came to pass, and they walked through the desert, and they all died, those over 20, except for Joshua and Caleb. So the hope for city builders is to face that desert where there's not enough resources of my own. To get to a place where it's only God, that's all that's left. And I can't do enough on my own anymore. I can't explain things, but I, I'm going to follow God. Get to the point where God is the only thing I have left. God wants to make questions changes in our lives he wants to make changes if we're ones who are wanting to control he he wants to change first of all the questions that we're asking instead of the question of well how can this be how does that work out but in recognizing also he wants to change the focus that we have one of the ways to do that is to see the trail of hurt that it has left when i've tried to control 
You know, sometimes you'd like to control. Maybe you came out of a religion that was controlling or a family that was controlling and you recognize it doesn't work. It's interesting, in God's kingdom, God never said you have to accept Christ as your Savior. He says that's the only way to life. And there are consequences if we continue in our own way. But he, he doesn't control us. He doesn't make us do things. He's given us free will to choose to follow him, to love him. And love cannot be forced. Neither can we force our children, control our children what they do. Oh, we can control them, but that's not where life is going to be for them. They're not going to learn the self-control that they need. And that's the goal. We, have, you know, As children, we have to control them. Don't go out in the street. and You need to do these things. And we get to the point then where we're counselors to them and, and coaching them and encouraging them to walk in the right way. But ultimately, they need to make their own decisions. When we see what God is going to do, we can either turn bitter or we can see what God's doing and that can make us better. So what's the new passion for those who were wanting control before? First of all, to learn to wait for satisfaction. In chapter 11, uh, we, we see them wanting satisfaction now. They wanted to build this tower. They wanted to make sure they weren't scattered, to make sure that things were there. And God confused their language and said it's not going to be that way anymore. We need to learn from Noah. Learn to trust God. Learn to expect greater rewards than what we can even imagine. Probably all of us can identify some with this desire to control. And God has given us, he's called us to have dominion over the earth. But when we're controlling to the point of leaving God out of it and not being willing to submit or listen to God and not submit to his will, then we're going in our own way. What we need to deal with is that feeling that I have to do it right. I, I have to make sure that I get it right, that my image looks right, that my children look right, that my family, that, you know, and we get to the point sometimes where we can almost be embarrassed and we're trying to control everything, embarrassed for how things turned out or, or what my children did or, or how my church looks or what my business, there, there are times where things just don't work out and we have to ask, what God, what are you doing? What are you saying? And keep going back to God. It is scary to come out of the comfort zone to recognize that if God is going to be Lord of my life, then he's calling the shots. I'm not doing that anymore. And that's kind of scary because that gives it to somebody else. And I want to be in charge. I want to be in charge of my life. But that's not what the Christian life is about. It's about Christ being Lord of my life. Didn't make sense to the disciples for Jesus to go to the cross. It didn't make sense at all. Why are you going to leave us? You're going to send to the Father. But Jesus said, if I don't go, the Spirit can't come. And so it's beneficial for you that I go away so that the Spirit can come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.